Welcome to A Growing Concern. This is our second program of the year. We took a couple weeks off and we're back ready to start covering some of the issues and events that are going on in the Portland area. Uh, just recently I got a hold of somebody about the ongoing issues going up at Longview Port. Uh, there's been some, uh, well I don't know if you call them strikes, but there's been some issues between the people that run the port or they're bringing, that are bringing uh, uh, loads of things in and and the uh, ILWU uh, Longshoremen Union and uh, I've been wanting to talk about this and I eventually finally got a hold of somebody at Occupy Portland and we have Axel Bell here from Occupy Portland. Welcome to the program Axel. Hi, thank you for having and me. And you say you're with a media group there? Um, I'm with the Occupy the EGT working group and I'm with the media committee that is uh, part of that larger spokes council that's mobilizing to um, work in solidarity with the ILWU. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of groups there at uh, Occupy Portland, right? <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> so, right, so I, I was kind of stammering around trying to introduce this, and I realized that I didn't really have all the right words for it. So could you just give us in a nutshell what was going on up there? Well, um, EGT, um, a multinational conglomerate um, corporation, um, has you know, built a grain terminal um, with about, with about $200 million worth of um, public funds uh, to in, at Longview. Um, their desire is to export um, grain um, around the world um, from Montana. And um, they, built the, uh, they built the grain terminal with the intention or with the promise of using ILWU historic labor. Um, that has they sign contracts mm -hmm. they have yeah the, all the ports along the west coast um, pretty much the ILWU has jurisdiction over and uh, historically for the last 80 years have been um, the ports have been their thing their, they have loaded the ports for the entire west coast um, and or so any ship that comes in from any company then yes so it doesn't matter the company right um, and so the EGT then um, was attempting to break that contract um, by hiring scab labor from Operation, uh, actually, yeah, operators, engineers, operation engineers, um, uh, local 701, yeah, oh, out of Portland. Yeah. Um, so, what what then happened was that Colwitz, uh, Colwitz and um, Colwitz County uh, Labor Council um, asked or passed a resolution for all of the 99 percent to mobilize in solidarity with them uh, to help them stop the grain ship. Um, because EGT refused to abide by that contract. So that's what we did. We mobilized in solidarity with them, taking guidance from them. And um, you know, there are updates now as to where the status of that is. When you say we, do you mean Occupy Portland or, or just local, local support? Um, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's everyone. It's, it's um, everyone that's interested in helping mobilize, <coughs> is mobilizing through the Occupy the EGT working group. Um, but it is an Occupy Portland like uh, core event, <coughs> so it's it's an Occupy Portland um, um, spearheaded um, caravan mm -hmm. um, up to or an Occupy in general um, West Coast right. um, spearheaded caravan up to Longview to support them, and they're calling for everyone to support them. So it's not just Occupy, but we are providing a lot of resources for people to get up there if they desire to. You're kind of like a <clears throat> a, a, a hub <clears throat> for information and people to find out about it and to and to and to participate. Then, yeah, meaning meaning the uh, meaning the Occupy Portland. Well, I noticed I've gone on the website and there's, there's there's all kinds of different things. Occupy Portland. I saw something uh, just as kind of an aside that there's going to be a big rally up in uh, Richland on the 15th, having to do with uh, uh, Hanford. Mm -hmm. So you folks are stretched out over time and space. There's a lot going on there. You may not even know about that because there's you know, <laughs> so many different people involved in this. Mm -hmm. But getting back, I just want to put that out there because Helen Caldicott is supposed to speak, and she's a well-known uh, anti-nuke activist. And uh, it's important to hear the people that have been in the trenches for you know, so many years about what they have to say about this. And even though Occupy Portland is a new movement, there are folks involved in it that are young like yourself, and there's folks that are involved in it that, are, that have been out there fighting these battles for decades already mm -hmm. and uh, these battles have been going on you know in this particular case we're talking about labor and I know that there, this was in the news quite a bit because laborers uh, people the union 
folks were up there getting in the way of some of the things that were going on. And I, I referred to it as a strike earlier, but I don't know if it was a strike. Um, it was a um, definitely it was a, it was a um, picket line, and Pickets there were order. there yeah. were actions against EGT, um, trying to stop them from filling their grain silo. Um, so there were actions stopping uh, trains, um, and there's there's been a lot of a lot of um, legal ramifications for that struggle um, between the ILWU and EGT uh, for the ILWU. Um, but um, the grain silo is now filled, and now we're um, planning to stop the ship if they don't agree to um, use historic ILW labor. All right, which brings, which brings up what I just saw on Indy Media and uh, all over Facebook that there's been some kind of tentative agreement. Now, me being cynical about, about the, the you know, bottom line corporate profit driven uh, situations is, could they be involved in this just until the grain ship shows up and then they're going to go back to their other ways of or uh, is that even a possibility given the, what, the structure of things right now? Well, it's highly important that we defend, um, we defend living wage jobs, we defend the, the, like, the long view um, workers, their, 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 their right to um, determine their conditions in terms that they, that they for their labor, um, especially since you know, driving down wages in one area unionized or ununionized is going to drive down wages for everyone else. Um, so, but we're still ready to, to mobilize. Um, we, aren't, we aren't backing down. Um, we are still following the ILWU's guidance, but we are ready to mobilize until we hear more information from the workers in Longview. Um, and whether it means that we mobilize to stop the ship, whether it means we mobilize to celebrate that we've made a win, mm -hmm. um, or whatever happens. Is that decision at the table, whether to accept this, going to be a top-down decision or a bottom-up decision? Because I can remember when the Oakland was calling for a West Coast uh, blockade or whatever, I forget the terminology they used, uh, a while back, there was a lot of talk that the ILWU didn't support that. But then it come to find out that <coughs> the, uh, a lot of the management of ILWU was against it, but a lot of the folks that were involved in the, the ground level of it were for it. So mm -hmm. is this going to be a decision made on just by a few people on top, or they vote for this, or, I mean, in order to accept the EGT? The nature of the, um, the, nature of the, the contract and their negotiations <coughs> are confidential, so we won't have information about that. Uh -huh. um, however, definitely the, um, everyone has really benefited from, I think, this is me personally, um, the D12 um, blocking the ports action, uh, mainly because we were able to uh, be well organized and when another issue came up, we were able to mobilize quickly and effectively to, to provide pressure on EGT to create that contract, to create that space. Um, so the rank and file definitely did support us and occupy the ports and uh, continue to um, guide us in how we will proceed mm -hmm. um, as far as the, the contract that we, we don't know. Right, because you know, Occupy Portland is. It's, well, there may be some people from ILWU involved with Occupy Portland, but you, you are uh, external to the actual labor union itself. Mm -hmm. And you know, this doesn't change like all all of the horrific things that EGT does or its um, its primary um, shareholder um, Bungie. It, it doesn't <coughs> doesn't alter the fact that you know that those that those economic problems, that the economic situation, is pitted against workers and is and benefits like profits um, and profits for the 1% or for large conglomerate corporations, um, it, we are still committed to um, fighting against an economic system that pits worker against worker and that exploits our natural resources and that, that undermines the fabric of our communities. Mm -hmm. So we still fight that battle um, and right. at the same time supporting the ILWU's right to determine its what it, what its conditions for its own labor are All right I and supporting their their rights to good jobs in their communities mm -hmm. so. there's just two issues i mean there's the issue of the local thing with egt but there's the whole issue of the larger uh, problems we have with corporate personhood and the fact that the corporations have so much power and Absolutely. Uh, fighting the local battle you fight the larger battle there was just that recent occupy the the courts uh, action here and in, 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 uh, nation, nationwide that, 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 that tried to 
address Citizens United, which was a decision made by the, the what was it five out of the f nine justices that allowed unending corporate money, and I don't know that if if uh, EGT is is wielded that their ability to do that in any way, but it does it did what you were saying there did strike a bell with me that uh, do they have a, a history of of trying to break labor unions. Um, they they have a history of. Um, exploiting labor around the world, um, they so have it's been, multinational. Then. Yeah, it's multinational. They, they, I mean, Occupy is definitely dedicated to and committed to creating global solidarity around that, and, and really, really opening up that that um, that that dialogue about what's going on with them, about uh, what they're doing all over the world, and how that's that's not just, um, and how we need global justice really. Um, in order to, in order for our communities to be to be safe against these conglomerates, we can't allow them um, or need to speak speak up against what they're doing in South America, for example. Um, in Brazil, um, they they have been accused of buying from um, from companies that have used slave labor, so essentially using slave labor, um, and have have not not abided by labor laws um, and have just over the history of their of, of their, um, their working have violated the, the Clean Air Act and have about $13 million worth of costs based on that. Um, they're not a great company at all. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, they're one of three companies that own 90% of, or at least their, their uh, parent company, Bungie, is one of three large conglomerates that own over 90% of the world's grain. Um, so, and they have a $500,000 fine from manipulating the grain market. So I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a very um, big problem when you have these large corporations that have such control over our basic um, uh, staples um, and have basically monopolized the the food market and manipulated it to create profit at the expense of people that are hungry, the most the most ne the most uh, vulnerable and most impoverished nations. Um, there are famines and people are profiting from this. So. Yeah, they you know the people that, that create all the genetic engineered food, they try to pretend that it's a, it's an issue of enough food, but it's not the food, it's the distribution of it. Absolutely. And there's people starving, and at the same time, there's abundance in other areas. Overabundance. Overabundance uh, as well. You know what you're saying strikes a, a, a bell with me. It seems to me I've read that uh, uh, the Columbia River we export 20 percent. What was it? 21 percent of our of, of, of our nation's wheat or of the world's wheat through here? I can't remember the exact, it's been months ago. So what exactly, what grains are they bringing in? Um, they're bringing in grain from Montana. Um, I'm not sure if it's GMO or not. I do know that they um, plan to export GMO corn and soy um, in 2012. Um, I don't really, I can't really speak to much more than that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm wondering how would they, so it, you know, I pictured this being grain coming in from other countries. I don't know how they would be shipping. I mean, uh, bringing boatloads of, uh, or is it? It isn't only boats. Maybe yeah, it's, they're it's actually rail exporting as well. the grain. They're, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. So they're they're doing this. To ex they're exporting, say, the grain that I was mentioning from Central Oregon to Central Washington, then. Um, as well, um, but most of the grain is coming for on <coughs> by rail from Montana. Um, they it's have three three loading docks that they've built there. Um, oh, okay. High efficiency. I, I had the total um, wrong impression. I thought they were unloading employment. ships. Yeah, the ship is coming into the dock, but they to have be to loaded. yeah to be loaded and then shipped off. Oh, all right. To, well, I know there's 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 issues in it. What what town was it? Um, a town just recently okayed the fact that they were going to be bringing coal into the West Coast and be shipped out. Um, I think it's St. Helens. St. Helens was the mm -hmm. one, that's right, yeah. So so there's a lot of people trying to fight that particular battle right now because there's St. Helens isn't the only one. There's a few different ports that are setting up to receive this uh, uh, coal shipments and they're going to be going overseas. And you know, we've all heard about the XL pipeline where they're trying to ship uh, or pipe oil from the, the dirtiest sands, or the dirtiest oil in the world, like uh, Winona Luke says, it's like trying to get oil out of dirt, and they're going to be shipping that down by via pipeline to, I think it's Houston, and then out to the rest of the world, meanwhile trying to pretend that this is going to alleviate our, our dependence upon foreign oil, and that, you know, it, it just, it's, it's just, just plain bullshit, there's no other way to put it than that, and there's an, another arm of that, it may not be the same companies, but at the same time, uh, it's the same mentality, and, this, and the same people are getting rich from their investments trying to ship this uh, 
well, ship in the right word in this case, but they try to by rail bring coal over over to this uh, part of the country and then and then export it from here. As uh, being involved with that uh, organization there from the uh, from the the ILWU, are you involved in any of the of this one I was just speaking about the coal and all that? You seem to know St. Helen, so um, I've I've been minimally involved, um, and I, I I get informed from just information that's flowing around. Other folks that are working um, on it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as, as far as I understood, you know, a lot of those decisions are made behind closed doors. Um, and now I'm not speaking for the long, the, uh, the Occupy the EGT working group. I'm speaking for myself. Um, just your so, experience, yeah, right? Yeah, from my experience. Um, so <coughs> a lot of those decisions are made behind closed doors. Um, the acceptance of, uh, of coal exports um, and loading like ships, shipments of coal from St. Helens was <coughs> Um, opposed by most of the people present when that decision was made. Um, and so, I mean, the groups that are working on that currently in Portland are the Sierra Club and Rising Tide. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they've done a lot of work to raise awareness and even in doing that and getting a lot of people to understand how this affects our entire state, you know, decision makers still make, still make the decisions they want to because they're funded by, mm -hmm. you know, corporations. So and these these people that made that decision are on the county uh, county committee or whatever there at St. Helens or the city or whatever, and they mm -hmm. made that decision behind closed doors. And I think that the governor even asked them to make sure that they did this in an open manner. Yeah, they, the governor asked for a public dialogue, um, a thorough public dialogue for considering uh, whether or not to export coal because it does affect every town along the way, um, all the way from. Montana or wherever it's other uh, the general was it called it's called the um, the the some basin I forget what it's called yeah it's a, it's, um, it's Colorado or uh, Montana and uh, Wyoming both I believe yeah and then it, it goes it'll actually pass if it goes to St Helens it'll pass through Portland so it is passing through all these small towns along the way all along the gorge and then would pass through Portland and move up to um, St Helens and it shoots off some ridiculous p amounts of pounds of coal dust all along the way, <coughs> mm -hmm. um, polluting our water system and polluting the air. Um, coal dust is really, really fine, so it, it'll get inside your house. Even if they cover uh, it, probably it would. It would. Yeah, get loose. and they're they're uncovered. They won't cover it. They, what they'll do is they'll they'll spray a chemical on it that um, will keep it from um, will reduce the amount of shedding that it does. But that's even questionable um, because. When, when you spray it with a chemical, then what happens when you burn it? What happens when you remove that chemical? Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't significantly reduce that. And like, with, and like with fracking, when they're pumping water and chemicals into the ground, they, they don't, the corporations involved in that don't have to give us any idea what the chemicals are. They're proprietary, and it's probably the same thing here. They won't tell us what it is, so we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and then uh, there we go again. Now, this might seem like an aside to some folks out there that are viewing this right now, but uh, you know, in my mind, it really isn't because we're we're dealing with we're dealing with uh, multinational corporations that are that are uh, out for their bottom line, and you know we can't blame them for that. But you know we need we need to pay more attention to the to people before profits. They can still make profits without doing things to the extreme that they're doing. At the very least, there's going to be some that'll say, no, we don't want any of this at all. And, you know, ultimately, I'm one of them. I don't think we need that coal brought over here because, from my mind, the more we do this, the more we're going to continue doing it. And it, uh, we need to start finding other ways of, of generating uh, our, our energy needs. And uh, I imagine that probably the folks that you're involved with would probably somewhat agree with that anyway that you, we need to be depending we need to be putting more energy into finding other sources rather than keep going down this same dirty road well i mean the the two issues are related um it, you know our food independence um and our local food so sovereignty and our energy independence and our energy sovereignty and i feel like you know a lot of corporations that and a lot of um shareholders that benefit and profit from the amount um of of ownership that they have over our energy and over our food um, probably don't want that. Um, in fact, Bungie is very much against food sovereignty. Um, Bungie over and over again will go to a nation and will um, completely monopolize its food resources. And so what it does is it takes away farmers' abilities to um, subsistence farm and that makes them dependent on importing 
food resources. Mm -hmm. And so what, it ha what happens is then, you know, there's more demand, quote unquote, more demand for, for example, uh, that's this, for example, EGT has an advertisement that says the, the demand for American grain is growing, but that's actually mischaracterizing the situation because what they've done is they've manipulated groups through free trade agreements, through, um, through eminent domain to take farmers' land and make them serfs to that land and then make them dependent on, uh, on, on, on external grain, on importing grain or importing whatever food resource they have. Um, and the whole idea is that that's somehow advantageous for the world, without but but because of comparative advantage in economics, you know, there's comparative advantage. You want to specialize in what you um, are relatively good at, mm -hmm. um, and so. But that but that actually doesn't it doesn't pan out. It doesn't work as a concept because we're not taking into account the fact that a very very small set of people own a very very large portion of. The food, the food resources of the world. Um, so they're actually continuously, once over and over again, against food sovereignty. And so food sovereignty is, is a solution as well as, uh, as, well as energy sovereignty um, that will help us free ourselves from these, these mega conglomerate um, influences <coughs> and stop feeding them, in all honesty, and stop being dependent on them. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely I would say that, that Occupy Portland is in support of interdependence and community-based alternatives. Um, I can't really say much more than that because there are so many different people involved and they have different um, solutions or different foci, foci of where they want to go. Mm -hmm. um, so, But what you're saying, you know, strikes a bell too because I forget what percentage of the world used to be, you know, agriculture-based. You know, it's, it's flipped where it used to be there would be a small por portion of the cultures or uh, of people in the cities and a, and a large group on the, uh, in the periphery and, 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 you know, growing their food. And it's flipped, almost exactly flipped. And it's happened in this country. Most, most farms in this country are farms, P-H-A-R-M-S. I mean, they're, 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 uh, they're farms that are, that are large conglomerates that are, that are growing our food, that are raising the animals. And... Uh, it's exactly what you're saying. It isn't just in other countries as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they they use um, industrial methods to mass farm um, using pesticides and um, GMOs that help them um, help them use like help them use those pesticides. Help the help the plants be um, uh, resistant to those those pesticides. Um, and I mean, honestly, that in a lot of places, if you look at the reason why they're not food sovereign anymore, is because of those agricultural practices that basically made the soil dependent or addicted addicted to um, petroleum-based fertilizers. So you, you go in to a place like Haiti and you destroy its rainforest and you um, in, in use industrial agriculture and then there's no more nutrients in the soil for them to be able to grow their own food. Or bacteria or, yeah. or worms or... Yeah, absolutely. So it destroys, <coughs> it destroys the nutrient um, rich soil and, and the rich bases in the soil. It destroys um, the local ecosystem. It destroys our, 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 um, our, the quality of our water, the safety of our water. And honestly, there, there, there aren't any real studies out there that show whether or not GMOs are safe. Um, that they, they, there isn't um, the way that the way that the the genes are the way that the genes um, are altered, <coughs> like carry over into our ecosystem uh, through cross pollination, and they um, they affect us in ways that we don't quite understand. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there have been links, and I need to do more more research on this myself. But there have been links between like infertility and GMO. Um, base foods. And so I'm, I'm still very skeptical and I haven't seen enough research to say that I feel really confident in, the, in mm -hmm. these, these institutions that are at, at best, I mean, they're, they're interested in selling these goods mm -hmm. and they're interested in doing it in a way that is the cheapest, which means that there needs to be least workers involved or workers need to be paid at the le as least as possible. And 
I mean, yeah, that's that's the situation. <laughs> and they've also created a revolving door between those corporations you're talking about, for instance, Monsanto, and the agencies, the a FDA, that are supposed to be watching over them. I just saw on TV that uh, they have just done, was it 50, 60, I don't know, years of research on, on, on the magic mushroom psilocybin and mm -hmm. found that it helps people to... Uh, uh, for depression. Well, to me, the story isn't the fact that they've spent 50 years, 40 years, whatever it was doing this, but they spend a minute and a half testing what you're talking about, these GMOs and uh, genetically modified organisms, and they just rubber stamp them when, they, you know, down the road, 20, 30 years from now, people may be developing allergies and different things from these. Why can't they spend 50 years testing this stuff? Well, obviously, because they, the, the people that are making the rules worked the month before for for uh Edvardis or or uh uh Monsanto or whatever and they just they just keep bouncing back and forth between the industry and the agency to sworn to protect them. Another thing that struck me was what you were saying is you say that they have to import like say what take another country, whatever one Haiti or whatever, they have to import food where they used to grow for themselves, but they are still growing things. So what they're doing is they're growing some kind of monocrop yeah, that maybe Haiti, is, is exported. But not in Haiti, but in South America, definitely. Um, that's what's occurring. I mean, rainforests are being cut down for the sake of growing soy um, and palm um, to export oh, palm, palm oil. oil. Right. Yeah. Right. So they, they have all that for export. So therefore, they can no longer feed themselves, and they have to import other foods. And they're also dependent on that company buying their labor, which at that point, it becomes a situation where they're not, they don't have a choice but to sell their labor. They don't have a choice but to go into, like, for example, when NAFTA happened. Like, like people that were subsistence farming had no choice but to move into cities and take labor with with sweatshops and well, like sweatshop sweatshop labor that paid them crap. Mm -hmm. And then you know we see lots of immigrants coming to the United States and we wonder why. Like why why do we have so many economic refugees from Mexico? <coughs> well, it's because of uh, us allowing our companies or companies that are even outside of the United States that somehow originated here to exploit people all over the world you know it's not even benefiting us mm -hmm. they're exporting our jobs <coughs> so and we're ex and we're allowing it through um, supporting uh, legislators who sign off on these NAFTA and and uh, similar free trade agreements that that are setting up the legal framework to allow the corporations to do this and there again I think the corporations are involved in writing this this uh, legislation to some yeah, degree or not. Absolutely. Um, I mean, on February 29th, there's the um, the shut down the corporations action, um, which is focusing on Alec, which is a um, a large. Um, Forget what it means. What it means, but yeah. Oh, I forgot too that the acronym means it's American Legislative um, Exchange Council or something like that. Whatever it's, it, it is, writes, it writes legislation. It's and just it's the a, opposite it's a, of what it's going to do. It writes legislation <laughs> and it funds uh, funds politicians. Mm -hmm. And so it's focusing on that as an issue. If you want to learn more about it, um, <coughs> I would suggest going onto um, the Occupy Portland website or the General Assembly website and plugging into that action because I think that's going to be a really great educational and awareness building opportunity. That's my next thing. You know, it's like researching and figuring out what what is Alec like. What have they done? Um, what what how, how have they influenced legislation and what companies are a part of those? Mm -hmm. um, and if folks want to go online, they could go online and just what plug in resistance to ALEC, A L E C. It's it's a uh, it stands for a certain a title for a, a legislation, so it'd be all capitals. And I'm sure you'd find quite a bit about it because I've been I don't know much about it either, but I've been hearing about it, and that's the first I've heard about that February 29th. This is a national or international. Um, there's been a national call to action. Um, I don't think it's international quite yet, but it might might end up being international. But right now it's a national call to action um, from from Occupy and I think one other group. But I don't, it oh, it's, it's the Portland. Actually, it's it's a, it's a Occupy Portland and the Portland Action Lab mm -hmm. have called for a national day of is action. This a, is this a, just a visibility action, just to let people know what's going on, or is there going to be actually a confrontation of some kind, direct action? I mean, this is yet to be seen. I have no idea what the action is going to look like, it's and ways nor away, do yeah. I. Um, I. I think it. It's beneficial to be kind of surprised, honestly. Um, <laughs> it likely will be organized by affinity groups. Um, affinity groups will take independent um, action um, directly against the corporations that are doing harm. Um, and that is an awareness building opportunity, yes, but it's also an educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity to um, 
mobilize, to organize, to become used to mobilizing and organizing, and to show our power as mm -hmm. as, as uh, collective people. Do you do you remember any of the? Uh, Multinational corporations that are involved in this, Alec, by any chance? Is EGT <laughs> one of them, by any chance? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to that right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we're kind of we kind of wandered a field, but you know, not really, because all these, the whole idea of the end corporate personhood and the and the movement to to check the power of corporations is because all these issues really are coming from the same place. You know, putting. Uh, profits before people and there's nothing wrong with people making profits I think one of the signs I saw is that you know a girl was holding a sign in Wall Street said I don't mind you being rich I mind you buying my politicians mm -hmm. you know and that uh, there's it's what you do with that money and uh, there's a lot of it isn't it isn't class envy it isn't it isn't uh, class warfare and as one another sign said it's only class warfare when we fight back and and now Wall now the Occupy Wall Street movement and and uh, the all the infinity organizations around the country and other parts of the world too as well are fighting back mm -hmm. and you know I think it, it really for me um, what I like to focus on is the fact that people just need their basic necessities met and we don't currently live in a system where that um, that is possible for everyone and it's all profit driven exactly and yeah. and people are left out of, out of the loop and people are are, are pushed down and in you know EGT and other corporations are uh, especially multinational conglomerates are part of <coughs> The race to the bottom, really. Um, you know, trying to drive down workers' wages all over. I mean, first off, in some places, making them dependent on the wages they receive from those companies, and then driving down the the wages to a point where they're not able to live on that, um, to survive on that. I mean, we have a foreclosure crisis that that is that is mitigated by um, faulty faulty funds and faulty faulty hedge funds. I mean, like it, it just. And then who gets who gets the benefit from that? Um, who profits from that? So, and then I think something that's even more disturbing is is the fact that the military wanted to get involved at the, at the, at at Longview. Um, the they, the um, ship that was coming in from EGT. Oh, well, the National Guard, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, it was. Uh, it was the Coast Guard. Coast Guard. That's yeah, right. Which that's right. military Coast Guard? I mean, they're armed with military weapons. Um, so, the Coast Guard was going to escort the grain shipment down the Columbia. Um, and I, I think you know we we absolutely condemn that. Um, I mean, uh, military hasn't been involved in a labor struggle since I mean, in almost 30 years. So it it just is a very odd system where people trying to defend their livelihood, their contracts, even <laughs> yeah, their legal contracts, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, trying to defend their livelihood and fight for their jobs and their families are criminalized and mm -hmm. um, profit fr and abuses from multinational corporations are defended by the military. <coughs> um, mm -hmm. Corporate interests are defended by the military. So, you know, we're sending our local, in this case, Coast Guard, in order to protect uh, 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 multinational corporations whose profits from the activities in this area go completely away from Oregon, go somewhere else, who knows where. You know, I don't know where EGT is from, but it goes ultimately it goes to was it Bungie? Um, yeah, they're they're multi, they're a majority shareholder. So we're we're protecting their interests in our in our state against the interests of our local people. Ultimately, is what it seems like it's happening Absolutely. to me. And that, that's you know you may or may not you know viewers may or may not be involved in unions may not think that unions are a good deal, but uh, they're your brothers and sisters they're your neighbors and that they have a right to to uh, have our government stand by the contract that was supposedly honored by this corporation, EGT. And, uh, you know, if they didn't have this, this, this uh, contract and they didn't agree to that, to me it would be a whole different ballgame. There would be a lot more fudge room in there. But if they, they did make that decision to agree, knowing that they weren't going to do it, it would seem to me. Mm -hmm. And they've gone ahead, and uh, I forget what what the situation going on up there. Has there been grain shipments come in that, uh, and and the union over here in Oregon went over ahead and unloaded them? Um, not not quite yet. No, that um, hasn't happened. The scab yet. labor has stopped. Um, they're un in negotiations, and we don't know the details of that negotiation. Um, but um, the ship has not come in, and that's that's where we're at. We're at a at a a um, moment uh, space. Uh, where we're still in the process of mobilizing, mm -hmm. and we're ready to mobilize, but yeah, you won't know when the ship. We keep ship comes in, meaning the ship comes in to export, 
Yes, Let's exactly. Go. The ship comes in to load the grain that's that's, that's already there. in the silo, yeah, and okay. to, onto the ship and then export it. So I don't know if other so folks got confused over that, but I sure did because mm -hmm. I, I didn't look deep enough into it. So the, the silo is full, it's ready to go, and the ship comes in and they load it then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and the... It used to be the union laborers had the contract to, to, to load the ships, and the EGT bought what? Bought the docks? Bought the... They, they were um, given at... I, I don't know the details of that too much, but they, they, were, they were basically given the, the, the plot, um, which is public land, um, to... And I know, I know that they were given some tax breaks, um, and were given $200 million worth of um, taxpayer money to help build this terminal, this export terminal, basically with the promise that they would use local unionized labor. And they, of course, they, like I said, they didn't use local unionized mm -hmm. labor. Um, and so this is just another example of a company, a private company, you know, socializing costs, um, taking money out of our community and ex exploiting our local resources and then using that to benefit themselves and not really considering the lives of the people, the local people that they've um, then built that terminal from. For, uh, in order, it's even more insidious than I thought then because, I mean, they're going to make money at it even using local, local labor. They just won't make quite as much money out of it. Or they'll bump the price up on the other end. Has there been any, any efforts to find out, is, is, are these grain shipments, since it's going to be shipped, uh, who knows where, do people found out where this specifically is going or that isn't that is it's very difficult to know um mm -hmm. i mean we could follow the money um after I it mean, goes that, yeah. yeah i mean we could follow the money i think that that would be the best way to do research on that because of course the grain's going to go where there is money to buy it mm -hmm. um which brings us to another point that the the grain does not really go <coughs> to the most needy people because the most needy people don't have money. don't have the money right so where the grain is going, I, I have yet to find out, mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. <laughs> well, I imagine you could probably, if you knew how to do it, you know, the EGT would have to bring it to a port somewhere, and they would have to have some kind of uh, connections with specific ports around the world. They just can't go wherever the, the, uh, the people have the money to buy it. They must already have some kind of connections with them. But who knows? It could be India. It could be you know anywhere in the world. And as you say, it would be probably developed countries. You didn't use the word developed, but people that have the money uh, would probably be developed countries, countries that uh, have oil money maybe or whatever it would take to buy this. Uh, what, what amount of grain are we talking about? How big are these ships? I don't actually can't speak to that either. Um, I do not recall. Mm -hmm. I imagine they're Sorry. enormous ships as well. Well, you know, we got about 20 minutes of left of the show. This has been a very interesting conversation. And I've kind of had some, some knowledge of what was going on here, but you've really connected a lot of dot for me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll open up the phones, and maybe folks want to call up with some questions. This is a large subject if you want to expand it to uh, what, what is going on with coal wanting to come through here, or the uh, like, like Ansel was saying, the, the situation with uh, in other countries where they're uh, you know, that's something I never plugged into at all. I, I wouldn't mind talking more about that if we don't get a call right away. The, the fact that other countries, uh, multinational corporations, are going in there and, and destituting the people, yeah. no other word for it, in, in order to uh, keep them as a wage slave and uh, the, demand that, you know, the, the, the demand for, for the grain that they need or whatever they need to subsist on has to be brought in from other countries. When, you know, like, like in India, all these millenniums even, they've been supporting themselves on, on their little gardens and, and, uh, and, uh, and probably village gardens as well. Mm -hmm. All that is thrown out the door now. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and what's interesting is that it's something that you know, we've been used to, um, having a very um, vibrant consumer economy um, we're used to that, you know, just we don't grow our own food, we don't have local food security, and the people that are most affected by that are people that are most impoverished and they have the least, least amount of say and voice, so we don't really hear about food deserts and how that, how that really affects people's nutrition. Um, and so when, you know, we hear that other places are still agricultural, people think, oh, well, you know, I mean, people may think, you know, oh, well, you know, they're underdeveloped, um, but actually they're stable. And by moving in and liberalizing them, what we're doing is actually 
Oh, <laughs> you're looking at something. Sorry. I'll wait for the um, phone number to come up. It hasn't come up yet, so maybe they're having yeah. trouble. It didn't mean to create a thought no there. No problem, no problem. Um, you know, by going in and then liberalizing them, actually what we're doing is we're making them dependent on the same companies that have capital um, and influence around the world. And so we're actually breaking their sovereignty and not giving them more freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, the, the economics of the situation is very complex, and I don't want to overgeneralize it, but um, I, I think that, you know, we, sh we shouldn't think, um, we definitely shouldn't think um, big company goes into into small nation to try to develop it. That's a good thing. Um, we should be happy, more critical than that, I think. It could be a good thing, but it hasn't worked out that way. Like, like in India, we've had a woman on the show not too long ago named Lua, who's got a website, Act Naturally, and she is now over in India. In fact, we just played this last week in place of me um, taking the, the, the week off. Uh, <laughs> there has been a move towards, uh, what, pesticides and inorganic fertilizers and all that, and it hasn't worked. Uh, well, we got a phone call. Uh, okay, we'll probably get the phone call, then we'll move on with this. Uh, first caller, you're on the air. Hi. Welcome to the program. Thank you. This is one of the best ones I've seen for a while. All uh, right. We've been off for a couple weeks. Yeah. Well, that's great that you're back. And I just had one kind of a clarification from my reading on the web, but it was based on uh, excerpt from Labor Press. My understanding of the situation with the, the union was that there were legal restrictions on what the uh, leadership could officially do that if the union officially did you know did a, a wildcat strike where that those officers they would all be in jail for you know a fair amount of time and this is one reason that they didn't want to be in a situation of justifying breaking a, a contract at the same time okay so it wasn't i don't i don't think anybody has been able to assert that the leadership wants this versus what the rank and file does, it seems like they were, their hands were pretty well tied on that. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm sorry if I misspoke about that. Definitely that, that is the situation that, that, that um, you know, big, like laws like, like Harley and, what is it, Taft-Harley? The Taft-Harley Act have, have definitely tied leadership <laughs> and unions officially their hands. So um, absolutely, yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Well, actually, I thought there, there, there were specific injunctions that, that they got. But also I wanted to ask, uh, from your description of the situation where there's negotiations going on, the ship's not here yet, but you know plans are being laid, it sounds like there's not a time of when the action's going to happen yet. Um, it could happen anywhere between now and the end of the month. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm unclear as to the status of the ship. The ship did, um, did come to some point where we were able to, to track it. Um, but I, I'm uncertain as to if the ship was turned away or not because there's a lot of, a lot of discussion, um, and I'm not sure. I can't. I can't really speak to where the ship is currently at. Um, I do know that if the ship were to come in, that we would be notified, um, and we would have anywhere from 12 to 4 days, and we would be able to mobilize and on that on the basis on that information. So you're going to be giving out information on how people can find out about when it happens, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, people can get involved um, in multiple different ways. Um, the information about how to join the caravan is on occupytheegt.org. Um, and there are multiple ways, like I said, that people can get involved. Uh, people can join the caravan, or people can um, organize local actions. Um, either at their Coast Guard, um, their, their Coast Guard if they have a local one, or the local face of EGT or Bungie. Um, so we appreciate all of those actions. And like I said, you can go on occupytheegt.org. There's an occupyegt.org. Okay. Uh, Didn't I hear something that EGT, yeah. like I mean, Goldman uh, Sachs, is the owner, part owner of them? I'm sorry? Isn't there a connection between Goldman Sachs and EGT? Probably. I mean, likely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure about that. But thing on that. All right, thank you very much. All right. And also, there's a, <coughs> I think how I actually got the phone number to call you folks was to the uh, Facebook page. Okay. Oh, we got another phone call. Get the next caller. You're on the air. Okay, next caller. Yeah, hi. Hey, you're on the air. Welcome to the program. All right. Well, I just wanted to, just, just wanted to point out, I just did uh, uh, cruising the internet and came across uh, your conversation here, and I'm just really curious about that because I'm in the uh, state of Nebraska, and mm -hmm. Nebraska has, uh, well, it's prairie, 
it's, it's uh, a landlocked. Land. Uh, they grow an awful lot of corn here. Uh, I have an awful lot of feedlots, uh, cattle, uh, corn, and, and stuff like that. And I just wanted to know if, uh, and I do know that, you know, uh, right here in the middle of the country, they have the, the biggest distribution center of Walmart, and they also have the largest railroad uh, distribution center in the country here in North Platte, Nebraska. So I wondered if your guest had anything to say about uh, what he knows about how the grain gets shipped across the country, uh, especially from a, uh, a grain uh, growing uh, state here such as Nebraska. And uh, we'll see what you have to say. All right, thanks. So from Nebraska mm -hmm. it would be corn probably. Yeah, I know we export corn. I, I am not an expert on um, all of the um, all of the conglomerate uh, um, or, or industrial agriculture in general. There are some people involved with the Occupy the EGT working group that um, specifically focus on food justice and also specifically focus on um, on like working against GMO crops um, and against uh, um, monopolization of our of our food. Um, I wish I knew that so I could inform you, but I, I unfortunately can't speak to that. Um, I do know that in Montana, there they built three um, highly efficient loading docks um, that would take grain from their own um, fields. So what they did was they actually they actually vertically integrated um, all of their all of their production such that they could minimize their costs. <coughs> and so that means that they own every step of their production process from um, the produ production of the pesticides to the uh, distribution of that to the land to the um, to the seed itself, um, GMO seed to the shipping, um, except that they you know ship through private means. So maybe not everything, but who, so who is, the, who is they? So um, did they own EGT it? Bungie? Ah, so they're the ones that built these three terminals in uh, in, yeah, in the in three Mon loading docks in Montana and right. then the, the export terminal in. Um, in so they own Montana. all of it then. Yeah. I think we have another phone call. For next caller, you're on the air. Hi. Hello, you're on the My air. Welcome to the program. Karen, and I'm calling about the American Legislative Exchange Council. All right. Someone oh, that I knows said what, it almost right. Somebody <laughs> that knows what we're talking about. <laughs> um, absolutely. That's corporations <clears throat> writing and voting on our legislation before it comes back to state and federal houses since 1973. Wow. And this Center for Media and Democracy uh, launched a website uh, last year, alecexposed.org. You we can are. go on there, and it's um, categorized by um, education. You can find history, all kinds of articles, um, ALEC members, both corporate and legislators. Um, it's quite interesting. We have really been taken to the cleaners. Well, I, we have been taken to the cleaners so many times, you know, we've mentioned the, the free trade agreements. It's somewhat the same situation when, when uh, the, in, indus, the various industries, corporations are uh, chumming up and with, with uh, legislators and writing these, these laws that benefit them, pretending and, and, and encouraging people to believe that it's, it's actually helping the people when it's, it's not at all. It's it's a marketing ploy, and right. you can probably tie a lot of it to Alec, and and you know they really encourage people really to learn and to spread the word. So that was AlecExposed.org. AlecExposed.org. All right. Well, I sure appreciate you calling in. Yeah, thank you. Because so that much. was kind of a loose end that we were leaving <laughs> out there. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Great. I love it when when uh, people know what we're talking about yeah, more, than, than we do. more than we do ourselves <laughs> but I've seen this Alec mentioned many times and I didn't realize that there was something you know specifically involved towards towards uh was it February 29th mm -hmm. so it's a leap year then yeah yeah absolutely leap all right Le <laughs> leap on Alec then, and, I guess. <laughs> and you know the if people should keep their eye out the um, spokes councils generally open up uh, probably will open up 
um, in the next few weeks. So people can be involved in the organizing of that if they want or can figure out how to organize um, affinity groups, can take nonviolent direct action trainings, um, can take media trainings, et cetera, et cetera, and get involved in any way um, mm -hmm. really soon. So people should look out for that. Sure, and I'm not sure I made the point, but because uh, the phone calls came in, that I, I first got a hold of the, the, the your organization through the uh, Facebook page. Right. So I think it was what, Occupy... EGT, EGT Facebook on page. Facebook. So folks out there on Facebook, seems like everybody is these days. I signed up specifically for, for this show, and I was surprised at just how many people you know I've met on there and how much information comes over this. It's just it's just incredible. People, uh, it seems like people spend their whole lives surfing and finding really interesting things to put on there. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, oh, we got another call. We haven't had this many calls in a long time. Uh, next caller, you're on the air. Hi, I'm calling from Milwaukee, Oregon. All right, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you. Great show. I've learned a lot. Well, thanks for I'm that. Just, I'm wondering what can people in Mil uh, in St. Helens do to put pressure on people who make decisions regarding the coal shipments? Um, well, right now um, I'm plugged in with some groups that are that are part of that are fighting against the um, coal export terminals and all over the Pacific Northwest. Um, Right now, I think that I, I can't speak for Rising Tide, um, but I can speak for Sierra Club. Sierra Club is calling for people to, um, I'm not speaking for Sierra Club, I'm speaking about them. About them, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, the Sierra Club is calling for people to contact Governor Kitzhaber and, and pressure him to mm -hmm. follow through with um, the, the statement that he wants there to be public dialogue, for him to put pressure on everyone else to create public dialogue around this. Um, around the export terminal, and other than that, you might want to just go on to um, what's the website? I think it's coalfreeoregon dot dot org, um, mm -hmm. and see if you can find some information there about how to get plugged in. Okay, well, thank you very much. Great uh, show. Thank all you. All right, both. thank you. Okay. Coal Free Oregon, I think, is a is a, is a sub website of, of Sierra Club. Yeah. They've got a whole bunch of them. And they've, they've done a lot of work. They were working on sh shutting down the, the coal burning fire, uh, coal plant out there in uh, Boardman. They've, they've done a lot of great things. And they're, they, they, uh, they may be a, ma a major, you know, mainstream uh, environmental group. And sometimes those are kind of iffy. But these folks in this area have done really good work, and especially along these things that we're talking about. And, uh, it's good that we went off in other directions, but we want to kind of bring it back with six minutes left here, talking about what was going on up at Longview out there. That that uh, you said from four to twelve days, so that means more than likely it won't happen this month then, because it's four days in the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be on into next month or the very first of the month. Then. I mean, we'll find out. I, I think it'd be really exciting if the ship was actually turned away, because I, I mean, there are. I can't. Really, I don't want to really speak about rumors because there were so many rumors flowing around, and I could go off on that. Um, but I mean, I think it'd be really exciting if if we put enough pressure on EGT to, for it to to move away and to say, you know, we're not going to load the ship. It's too much problems. It's going to be really bad press for us. It's also just a really big strain on on the local local police force and. And so, you know, let's let's all work together, you know, that's I guess. Good. Well, that's the whole idea of protest, you know. It's, it's, a, it's the first, first is to shout out loud enough that people find out about something mm -hmm. and then to, and then to and, uh, put the monkey wrench in the gears, you know, like the old, what is it, the Earth First that has the monkey wrench as their, as their, uh, uh, their emblem. They put the monkey wrench in there so that that, that slows things down and allows people to realize what's going on. That's yeah, how a lot absolutely. of that's how a lot of forests have been saved or portions of it have been saved because they put those those uh uh, tree sits up. They put these different things up. It slows things down enough, and it gets the attention of, of the people that uh, uh, things get saved that normally would have gone down. And and if those longshoremen up there had to done what they did, and some of them just recently what got fine or whatever. Um, actually, there were a good portion of them that got arrested. Um, I I mean, got arrested and fined. The unions has mm -hmm. has fines. Um, uh, there's a large portion of them that got arrested, over 90% of them, I think. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it, was, it right. was a lot of them that got arrested in the process of just trying to defend their jobs. And if that um, hadn't happened, you could bet the corporate media may not have been out there. Absolutely. You know, or they might have sent somebody out with a, with a camera but not a live feed. I mean, but the media still has been very hostile towards the LWU. I mean, the LWU is historically a very progressive <coughs> union. It's been fighting for um, workers' rights. It's been fighting for for you know against apartheid and, and for you know just 
basic human civil rights for, I mean, the, the, all of the 20th century. So, you know, I, it's it, to, for the press to give them such a bad rap about about trying to defend their jobs that that entire community really depends on. The community really does depend on the uh, good ILWU jobs. Um, is appalling. I, I have no idea why they would do that, but but yeah, even amongst bad press, um, we pulled it out. Yeah. Well, you know, I, sometimes they say there's you know there's no what is it the, no promotion that's that's doesn't work even if it's bad. I mean, people heard about it, and even though the media were trying to spin it, you know, they spin it because. Uh, all the local media now is owned by multinational corporations, or at least national corporations, and so they generally take the side and try to of uh, of the one percent, so to speak, in those terms, against the people that are that are, that are the, uh, the 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 ninety nine percent, the workers, disruptors, protesters, um, right, and and the fact that this was a contract, I, I have. They did mention that. I saw coverage of it. They did mention that, but they never really leaned on that, saying, oh, well, what, what, is, what, what should be the repercussions of someone that breaks a contract? They never went down those roads at all. They just wanted to talk about what should happen to these folks that, that are uh, breaking the law and then getting arrested. Well, we got about two minutes left, and we got a last phone call. We'll try to squeeze this last call in. Uh, next caller, you're on the air for about a minute. Hi, Jim. I just wanted to call to thank both of you for what you're doing. You're doing very different things, but it's all important. It all sticks. It all comes together, too. Well, that's my next comment. Oh, everything right. is connected. <laughs> right. Absolutely everything is connected. And I think with Occupy and what's going on, we're going to critical mass this spring. And I am so excited. So keep it up. You all guys right. are doing great. Okay. Thank you. Now that they mention that, we've got exactly two minutes left now. There's going to be some critical mass on May Day. It's supposed to be a national strike. If you folks, you must be plugged into what's going on with that. Yeah, I mean, um, there is probably a lot going on. I, I think that we're, the mobilization <coughs> for that is still, you know, working. So it probably will be a similar thing where we have spokes councils that are, that are planning actions um, and affinity groups that are doing that kind of thing. I can't really speak very much about that, actually. But we have plenty of time. Because it's, <laughs> it's all the way in May. Like, yeah, there's so much <laughs> going on between now and yeah. then. But, but uh, you know, as uh, as Reverend Billy said a while back, you know, we're going to be setting roots. He didn't use those terms, but we're going to be setting roots to the winter, finding ways to be creative. And uh, come springtime, we're going to, uh, we're going to, this is going to kick off. And folks that are out there in, in the TV land, uh, just remember that uh, just like in the uh, Occupy Wall Street kicked off, we need the bodies out there. We need to let the one percent know that uh, we're not. No one's going back to sleep. You know, they may be going into dormancy for a while, but no one's going back to sleep. So we got about thirty seconds. You want to just kind of give a synopsis of yeah. what, who, how people can get involved? Um, I mean, Occupy Portland has an office now. I mean, I, I think that really it's not even about, you know, Occupy isn't the office. It's really it's really getting involved in your community and building community and, and really feeling like we're building those relationships that are going to last long term. So I, I'm very supportive and very excited about the spring and mm -hmm. look forward to what we can all do together and the change we can make. Right. And Occupy EGT, I think, was one oh, of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you want to get involved with the caravan, yes, you can get on OccupyTheEGT.org. Um, and plug into the caravan. You can, if you can provide food or housing or need food or need housing or need a ride or can give a ride, that's all there. That's so. all there. All right. We're down to about 10 seconds. want to thank the crew. Did a great job. want to thank the callers. Thank the caller we got from Nebraska. You know, too often we get people from other parts of the country. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.